Hi, I'm Wahid Abdullah from Bragg Development Institute. I guess if I go by reading out those those slides, I think it will take more than 10 minutes. So I'll just say briefly that what BDI do, what BDI does. Uh, very briefly, we have both the both we are both interested in educate um, academics and research in the on the academic front. We have two masters program: masters in development studies and masters in development management and practice, which is in collaboration with Columbia University. On the research side, probably which at which we were interested in here, uh, we we do lots of different types of work. Uh, uh, different types of work. We already we are already engaged in in a couple of RCTs. Uh, ironically, outside Bangladesh, not in Bangladesh. Um, but in Bangladesh, we are planning to start a couple of couple of RCTs, uh, which means that we are kind of. Um, we're kind of very much appreciative to our cities, and we're open to 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 do that. But uh, so for for that matter, it would be very uh, very we, it would be very um, uh, exciting to collaborate with USI uh, and JPL on on, on uh, urban sanitation services. About uh, with on on the urban poverty, uh, BDI is currently doing uh, a, a research in collaboration with uh, WaterAid. Um, uh, we still, we, 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 it's still, it's a four-year pro project, but we still didn't finish it. We, we are hoping that once we are, we're done with it, we'll get some interesting results out of this. But of course, we don't have our city in there right now. But uh, uh, you know, we are we really open to 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 do our city in other projects, uh, considering uh, on urban poverty. Um, uh, having said that, like we will be really glad to work as a local researcher. Uh, so if you're interested in doing our city and uh, on USI, uh, we'd be really glad to collaborate with you. Thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit specifically about BRAC's urban programs and some of the things we're doing there. And then Dr. Jain will follow with a, a broader overview of what BRAC and the Research and Evaluation Division does. Um, some of our major programs that we have in urban areas uh, build on our rural model. So microfinance, education, and health are kind of, I'd say, the three pillars of what we do. Um, and we're operating at a fairly large scale within Bangladesh. Uh, for health, where last year we um, had about 2.6 million users of our services um, that range from maternal, neonatal, and child health to um, buying kind of basic health commodities from a community-based volunteer. Um, our education program is also quite large. We have over 2,000 primary schools in urban areas and had uh, a total of 77,000 primary school students, um, as well as 23,000 pre-primary school students and um, adolescent clubs that work with about 8,000 adolescent girls. Uh, so those are sort of the major components. Um, we've also done some interesting smaller programs in urban areas, including one looking at sexual harassment in schools and how you can create a safer uh, and more positive environment for girls, um, doing a lot of sensitization with both the students, uh, teachers, and the principals as well. Um, and then we have some sort of interesting models that are a little more complex. So I won't get into the details now, but we can talk about it later. One of them is a program we have targeting the ultra poor, uh, which is very comprehensive, uh, includes both sort of these harder services like health, um, skills, assets, but also a lot of thinking about aspiration, social isolation, and how you can bring people that sort of live at the kind of the margin of communities more into the center uh, and integrate them better into communities. Um, another one is, it's called the STAR program. It um, takes very promising students who completed primary school but uh, dropped out of secondary school and plugs them into the growing uh, service sector. So it gives them a combination of practical skills and um, practical training where they're paired with a mentor uh, and they work in somebody's shop doing motorcycle repair, uh, mobile phone services, tailoring, beauty parlors, um, and then a theoretical component. So those are sort of some of the things that we're doing right now. Um, there's a few pictures here, including our, our ultra poor program. Um, and this is one of our community health volunteers walking through a slum in Dhaka. Um, some of the stuff that I think is probably most interesting to this group is are the projects that are just getting started. So some of the changes that we see coming down the pike way are increased use of technology. Um, we've added a mobile phone uh, data collection component to our mobile health services, as well as a helpline. 
um, emergency response, especially if a woman is going into labor in the middle of the night. And so thinking about what the opportunities are around that to um, you know, implement them in a better model. Um, another program I wanna mention is our safe migration program. We know that one of the major reasons people leave the rural areas is because of poverty. And so often they're choosing between urban opportunities within Bangladesh and the chance to go abroad. And so we are expanding our safe migration program uh, to sort of help people recognize the opportunity to go abroad as a way to increase their economic opportunity. Um, we're also starting fee-based secondary schools in rural and urban areas, uh, which might provide some opportunities uh, for partnership as well. Um, and then some things that we're just sort of thinking about, we haven't really started working on our, you know, there's a huge number of people that move between the urban and the rural areas. For example, this picture in the bottom right is uh, rickshaw drivers who come for a few months and then they go back to their rural villages. And so what sort of services do you offer people who are moving all the time? They're neither rural dwellers nor strictly urban dwellers. Um, so thinking about that, we also have uh, integrated a mobile money component into our microfinance program, helping people send money uh, via their mobile phone. And so that may be a component of this as well. Um, savings products linked to that, we're doing that on a small scale in several programs, but we're not using the mobile phones nor any sort of um, really formal component. And so thinking about how we would integrate that into some of the existing packages. Um, another big area of interest for several of our programs is how we engage men in women's empowerment. Uh, and we've done some small scale work in our maternal and child health program, um, but there might be other opportunities as well. Um, okay, so you know, there's several of us here from BRAC, so if you have questions, please do come and find us to talk about them during the coffee break. Perhaps you know the BRAC is the largest NGO in the world. We had, it has massive work, massive program. The mission of BRAC is to empower people and communities in situation of poverty, illiteracy, disease, and social justice. BRAC's intervention, interventions aim to achieve large-scale positive changes through economic and social program that enable women and men to realize their potentials. The main programs of BRAC are microfinance, agriculture and food security, education, health, water, sanitation, and hygiene, that is WASH, disaster, environment and climate change, advocacy and human rights, gender, justice and diversity, human rights, and legal aid services, community empowerment and integrated development programs in urban and rural areas. So we can think the magnitude of BRAC's programs. Actually, the structure and size of these projects varies depending on program target, availability of fund, time, and location of implementation, personnel, and target population. For instance, WASH 1 was completed in three phases over five years period, covering 150 sub-districts across the country. Each phase includes 50 districts. Now, WAS 2 has, has been initiated in an additional 98 sub-districts in hard-to-reach areas. The general needs being addressed by, by the program are to ensure access to safe water and safe sanitation, hygiene, education of health, provide microcredit to improve their socioeconomic status. Each program follows separate approaches to address these needs. BRAC WASH program has been working in rural areas since 2006. It has limited intervention packages in urban areas, focusing on secondary towns. The program can improve sanitation situation in urban slums selection of affordable technologies for on-site or off-site sanitation remains a critical issue for providing sanitation facilities in the urban informal settlements. Besides, the condition is getting worse due to climate change and disaster, thus improving access to safe water and sanitation in dis disaster-prone areas 
is another potential area to work. The future, uh, the impact of these activities of this project are evaluated through using RCT. Some of the activities for impact evaluation are adoption of affordable sanitation technology, school sanitation program, and hygiene education. Randomized evaluation method estimates programs impact using both treatment and control group. The difficulty remains, as, uh, as most speakers or somebody has already told, the difficulty remains in getting ideal control groups for research. Through randomization solves, though randomization solves the selection bias, but poor choice of control groups may lead to confusing results. Results from randomized evaluation provide appropriate guide to the policymakers and practitioners. Future area of research may be on black primary school, water sanitation, hygiene introduction in the urban areas. Uh, that's all in a very short about BRAC. Thank you. I'm representing WaterAid in Bangladesh. WaterAid is a UK charity working in 26 countries in the world. Uh, in comparison to BRAC, it will not be even its 1% in magnitude, both in population coverage, financial turnover. So consider us as a very modest uh, international NGO. I'll be limiting describing its urban program only. And when I say urban, uh, the Dhaka city comprising of 12 to 15 million population, whereas a small town could be 25 to 30,000 population. And we have program in all three setup. Now our main urban program is in uh, three city corporations, and uh, soon we'll be covering five city corporations, but the total population coverage will be half a million kind of. The main innovation that we did a number of years ago is that without any land entitlement, the utility company, means the water company, never used to connect, pipe water connection to the household. We could change that. And since then, we have been adding on some of the services. So in this new phase of the urban program, we are trying to increase access. We are trying to improve the quality, the time uh, of collecting water. But we are adding on a few more things like solid waste management, menstrual hygiene management, food hygiene, and so on. So now, sometimes we wonder that number of things we are doing in the name of comprehensive water sanitation and hygiene and in the paradigm of right-based approach to water and sanitation in context of 2010 adoption of WASH as a human rights, what we are doing. Could we be more focused or the way we are doing a broad spectrum of things, that's the best way to go. So probably there are certain areas that we can really explore or investigate and can really sharpen our program uh, to benefit uh, uh, the people or the beneficiaries. Fortunately, in the new phase, we have baseline done, and we have planned for midterm and end term. But probably some of these kind of rigorous method, research methodologies can also help us. In the small town, which is a 25, 30,000 kind of population size, we are working in uh, five small towns, hardly 150,000 population altogether. But there, we are actually, our approach is more from the right based perspective, meaning by promoting local level good governance, we are trying to improve the water sanitation and hygiene situation in those small towns. And in some towns, it is the leadership. In some towns, it is the effort of intervention. In some town, it is the, you know, the mobilization by the project that really works. So maybe again, I mean, the approach is to have inline baseline as baseline and inline kind of, but we can explore some of the things. The most important one is fecal sludge management in urban context, in city corporation level, medium-sized town, and in small towns. We have certain solutions on emptying, but we are struggling with the technological solutions on fecal sludge management. We are not seeking any technological support here, but we are seeking for expert advice on how we evaluate which technology is working and what we could do more. Thank you.
my name is Ajahar Ali. I am representing UPPR project. And BRAC is the largest NGO in the world. And UPPR possibly the largest poverty reduction urban program in the world too, as we claim it. <clears throat> So EPPR project, I think uh, this is a very complex project. I think uh, this project is managed by UNDP and the local government engineering department of the local government ministry of the country. And then we have a technical partner, is our event habitat, who are providing technical support in it. And the local government institutions, that is municipality and city corporation, 30 cities and towns authorities are involved in this project too. And then donor of this project, as I said, it's DFID, and the fund is $120 million. Project started in 2008 and to be end by 2015. And this project has some of the beauties. The one of the beauties is that the community mobilization. So the project itself has chosen the output number one is the mobilization of the poor communities into groups. I think primary group and then few primary groups from community development committee with 200, 300 households together. And then community development committees form a cluster community committee and then a federation at the town level. So this is the community organizations of the poor people. And then these community organizations, the poor people, they identify their own needs and they prepare their own community action plan. They identify the participatory identification of the poor through a participatory process. And then they develop the project. And then they send that project proposal to the project authority for funding. And we, from the project level, we send money directly to the community bank account. The community people, they withdraw the money and then they implement the project. And we have project staff to support implementation of the project. So delivery of the services by the community organization is a beauty of the project. We don't have NGO. We don't, we don't have government tendering process to implement the projects. But the community itself are implementing the project. And one of the area of this interest can be how delivery mechanism works here in this project. Cost effectiveness, governance, and all other elements of service delivery uh, can be an area to look into. And then, what they delivered? They have delivered two major things. That is one is uh, the infrastructural services that include water supply, basic water supply, sanitation, uh, uh, and the footpath, drainage, all sort of basic infrastructure, improvement of housing. And the other part of it is socioeconomic component that includes uh, it's a, it's a livelihood elements, that is skill development training, and then business startup grant, education grant, those are the things. So these two major components are contributing to the poverty reduction. So which are the components are supporting more to the poverty reduction, that could be an area also to make an assessment of it. So this is what the project is. And uh, we are planning to start a new project. And this is the time from where we can learn something and make some kind of assessment to make some kind of recommendation to the future project designing. Thank you all. The reason I'm here is uh, because 3IE is a grant-giving institution, uh, a grant-giving institution which is funded by, amongst others, uh, Gates, uh, DFID, uh, the Hewlett Foundation, and uh, many other bilateral donors. Um, a lot of the initiatives that we fund are also located in Bangladesh, and therefore my nominal presence in this country team. Uh, but what is a I think what is important for me to point out here is uh, that 3IE also funds uh, JPAL evaluations, by the way, um, is that we look, at, we look at impact evaluations so that they can make a difference. This, is, this speaks to one of the questions that I, I think the lady here um, um, sort of asked the audience as well as the organizers. What is wrong with what we do now? 
I don't think that's the right. I, I don't think we're going to say that there's something wrong. It's just that it's not the whole deal. What you want to try and answer is, um, is the question, can a change be attributed to a particular program? And for a lot of implementers, that becomes an important que question to answer in the Millennium Villages uh, initiative that Raymond brought out, the example. Uh, the question that was being asked is, what, what is the change that the Millennium Villages are bringing about? So that's my presentation. Um, the main mandate that 3IE uh, has is improving life through evaluation. And the idea is to then try and fund and uh, provide resources as well as technical expertise for impact evaluations, where impact, evalu where impact can be proven by not just our cities, but also other quasi-experimental methods, and anything that really has a methodology behind it which can prove attributable change. There are three ways in which we do this. Um, so the first one is through open windows. Uh, a lot of you know about 3i's um, open window program. Um, it's really a, a cross-cutting, non-sector denominated um, window where 3i funds um, impact evaluations on any subject. Um, we have funded about 75 impact evaluations till now. Um, the most recent uh, open window closed, uh, I think, two weeks ago, and we got 634 applications. But one of the questions that quite a few of you have come and asked me as well um, outside of the confines of the meeting are, you know, what are the areas and how can we apply and how is this relevant? Um, how can we take this to... Uh, our own organizations and how can we use it in our own organizations. So we work with researchers um, such as JPAL as well as the academic and the intellectual powerhouse that JPAL represents to then um, provide um, financial resources as well as technical expertise for impact evaluations that you might want to undertake. We also have what are called thematic windows. So uh, thematic windows, for example, urban services, that's a thematic window where we also, we also uh, provide technical expertise for other themes such as social protection. Our most uh, recent thematic window, which um, is, has closed a, a few months ago, is on social protection. And we are looking at two additional thematic windows, one of them on agricultural innovation, which is funded by IFAD. Uh, by AGRA and possibly uh, Gates, uh, as well as DFID, possibly. Um, we are also looking at two others, uh, at another one which is on climate change, which includes interventions which are related to adaptation and mitigation. Um, so again, agencies that are looking or, or big, large organizations that have a particular sectoral concern and want to ask questions and answer questions on wh what is the evidence out there in terms of a particular sector that we are, or that we are targeting. Um, 3IE helps to provide technical expertise on that, on those, as well as uh, provide uh, financial resources and support. The most important one, I think, from my perspective, is uh, the policy window. And that's important because under this window, which is a continuing window, and we work continuously with governments and organizations that are very closely affiliated with national governments, um, is the policy. So the policy window is specifically directed to that. And the idea is that within the policy window, we work with the government to provide a preparation grant. So um, if the government of uh, Bangladesh or um, Sri Lanka or India um, want to put together an evaluation of a large policy relevant initiative, we provide first the technical expertise as well as a preparation grant to just think of the design behind, uh, behind that uh, evaluation. 
And then depending on the robustness, and again, this speaks to the internal validity as well as the external validity of the design of the evaluation that comes from the, uh, the preparation grant, we then provide what are called policy window grants. And these can range from about $100,000, which was given to Uganda, um, to a million dollars, which is um, in China, for example. And we've, uh, we are in the process of funding uh, or are funding about seven of these policy window grants. Uh, the idea is really to encourage developing countries uh, governments to think much more in a much more policy uh, relevant and impactful way uh, about impact evaluations. And again, the idea behind the, even the inception of 3IE is to work with low and middle income uh, developing countries uh, to generate capacity as well as create the evidence base for policy change. Uh, one of the other significant activities that we do are systematic reviews, and this is really my last slide, um, which really coalesces and consolidates evidence that's coming out from a variety of impact evaluations to then provide an idea of what is the commonality um, of context, of backgrounds, of, of uh, uh, stakeholders within which then the evidence is um, relevant and the evidence is valid. So systematic reviews help to put these together, and these are managed by our London office. We have offices in three countries, uh, Washington, London, and uh, New Delhi. And it's headquartered in Delhi. And finally, we provide uh, training and quality assurance. So thanks very much.